So we are in this series called Upside Down, where we're talking about the kingdom of Jesus is upside down to the kingdoms of the world. And we began last week when discipleship pastor Rick Wood talked about the upside down King Jesus, who gave up position and privilege and instead served and sacrificed. And as you might expect, an upside down king like that is building an upside down kingdom. Now the Bible tells us there's going to come a day and John talks about it in the book of Revelation where the kingdom of God is going to be restored. And he gives us a glimpse of the glory, what that will look like when we all stand in the presence of the king, one beautiful, diverse community. But in the meantime, that kingdom's not yet been restored. We live in this in-between time. And in this in-between time, the followers of Jesus, his church, are to build that kingdom, to be part of Jesus building that kingdom right here, right now. His church is to manifest his kingdom. I want to say that again. His church, you and me, us, are to manifest his kingdom. So Pastor Tim and I this morning are going to be sharing some thoughts about what his church, his upside-down kingdom, looks like. Unlike the kingdoms of the world, which are me-centered or me-focused or my-focused, the kingdom of King Jesus is other-focused. Now, our format this morning is Tim and I have co-taught a number of millennial gatherings together, and they seem to go well, so we're going to try it here in service this morning. And if it doesn't go well, it will just mean that you're not as hip as our millennials. That's right. So, That's right. So uh, Pastor Tim's going to start us off. That's Pastor right. Pastor Tim. Thank thanks. you, Rob. Good morning, everybody. So I'm excited to do this with Rob. Rob is, is legit. He's a legit leader. Um, he refuses to dress like me, but other than that, <laughs> we get along well. So listen to this. At the time Moses was born, he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. That's Acts 7.20. So at the time Moses was born, he was no ordinary child. Now, scriptures doesn't, doesn't tell us he's doing quantum physics in the bassinet. Scripture doesn't tell us he's playing Mozart in the bassinet. It simply tells us he was no ordinary child. I happen to believe that all of us, when we're born, are born not ordinary, just like Moses. But the sad reality is a lot of us die ordinary, right? Um... So think about this. Before your mom and dad um, even knew each other, before they hooked up and listened to the Beach Boys, Barry Manilow, or Barry White <laughs> to get in the mood to create you, God had something amazing in Scripture in Jeremiah 1.5. Let's take a look at that. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. So here's the modern day interpretation of that scripture. Um, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I hooked you up. God gave us everything that we needed, filled us with everything that we needed um, so that we wouldn't live and die ordinary. Long before your title, Long before your zip code, long before you became partner, you had everything that you needed um, to not die ordinary. Let's take a look at that scripture again. <clears throat> before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. So here's a few things about this scripture and God setting us apart. Again, as I just mentioned, your family, your neighborhood, your education, your vocation, all those things supplement this uh, setting apart that God did for us. Um, um, you are not set apart because of those things. If I could only get a raise, if I could only get to 100K a year, if I could only meet him, if I could only meet her, then I would be set apart. Then I would have it going on. Not according to Jeremiah 1.5. Here's another thing about this scripture. Here's the unfortunate part about this scripture. You can abuse and abort this special setting apart that God did for you, right? We've seen in the scripture. 
We've seen it in 1 Samuel 15, I believe it was, when King Saul was appointed king and he disobeyed God's instruction and he lost his kingship, right? And that's the thing, when you're set apart, you get special instructions. And when you don't listen to those special instructions, um, you get replaced. He got replaced by King, uh, King David. Here's another thing about uh, Jeremiah 1.5, and this is my favorite part about it, because at the, at the tail end of it, it says, I appointed you as prophet to the nations. Wait a minute, I'm in my bassinet. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm not even in the bassinet, I'm in my mother's womb. Not even that, before I'm in my mother's womb, before my mom and dad listened to Barry White, you formed me and called me a prophet to many nations long before I had anything to do with it. So because he formed you, he knows you. That's why he can make, make the call to call you a prophet to all the nations and not just the northwest suburbs or not just the Chicagoland area or your division at work. He can make you a prophet of many nations. I just love Jeremiah 1.5. Here's the, here's the deal, y'all. The truth of it is, is all of us start off like this can of whatever's in here. I ripped, I ripped the label off. Um, full of something. Something in here. Full of potential, full of gifts, full of skills, full of abilities, full of intellect. You're so charismatic. Such a nice dimple. That's such a nice mole that sits just above your lip or brow or whatever it is. You know, you, you, we all start off like this, ready to be opened, ready to be poured out. You know, again, I took the label off, but the label would tell you the ingredients in here, what type of gifts you have, what type of skills you have. It also tells you on some cans how much you're supposed to serve, how many people can you serve, right? All of us start off like this can, full and, uh, and close. But the reality is uh, we were called to not stay like this. So here's the deal. All of us in this room, all of us under the sound of my voice, um, you have a born date, right? What's some of those born dates? Let me hear some of them. Let me hear the year. What was that? I won't look at you when you say it. 91. 59. Ralph said uh, 79 for Ralph. <laughs> so that's the deal. We have a born date. You know, yeah, you're looking back at, if you, you, we ha all of us have a born day. If you're looking back at me, you're living on, you know, that dash, which I really think should be called, it should be a squiggly line than a dash, because life don't move like this. That's a flat life. That's no movement. That's nothing. It's more, it's more, it's, it's there ebbs and flows to life. There's ups and downs to life. There's high highs and low lows. So all of us are living on that dash, and we have a responsibility to move from this full can to an empty can while we're on that dash or squiggly line. And here's the reality. As we're on this dash, um, we have a supernatural responsibility, especially after you say yes to Jesus Christ, right? No more normal living, no more ordinary living. We have a special responsibility. You know, when we say yes to Jesus, um, we agree um, to operate and live in this upside-down kingdom that we've been talking about since last week. You know, no longer are my gifts, skills, and abilities and talents um, just for me. They essentially belong to someone else. They aren't just for me. They aren't just for my kingdom, my kids, my culture, my neighborhood. Um, they're for someone else. Let's take a moment and talk about uh, what's on the inside of this can, which is really you and I. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show us that this, uh, this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So not only are you not ordinary, but whatever is stirring, going on, percolating on the inside of you, um, the Apostle Paul describes that uh, he considers it valuable, right? And so he describes it in two ways, basically. He describes it as a treasure. The gifts you and I have are a treasure. But unlike the world's kingdom, this treasure is not to be locked in a chest. This treasure is not to be hidden. This treasure is not just for me 
or this treasure is not just for the person who's in possession of the treasure. Amen. Right? In this upside uh, down kingdom, that treasure is to be poured out, distributed, um, and it's not to lie dorm- dormant. I don't know if any of you remember the uh, fictional character Scrooge McDuck, <laughs> right? So I was first introduced to Scrooge McDuck uh, from the cartoon DuckTales. So he was the great uncle, I believe, of like the little ducks that was in DuckTales. And I know what you're thinking. What yeah. does any of this have to do with that scripture or have to do with what we're talking about? But uh, Scrooge McDuck had this signature move probably every episode, I believe, or in the, uh, in the opening Uh, credits or whatever, where he would dive into his treasure and he would just swim around in his treasure. That's what this has to do with our life today. A lot of us are just like Scrooge McDuck. Every day we get up, we we wake up and we dive into the blessings that God has given us and they're only for us. They're only for the people that look like us. They're only for the people in our family and we don't let anybody else into that, into our pool. You know, instead of making our treasure an endless pool for everyone to jump in and enjoy, uh, we make it a kiddie pool just for us and our people. In an upside-down kingdom, that treasure on the inside of you is for the outside world. Here's the second way Paul uh, describes the things going on on the inside of us. And let's, let's just read it one more time. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show you that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So what does surpassing power mean? Well, the treasure that you have on the inside of you, um, it's fueled, it's funded by God. Not your university, not your spouse, again, not your zip code. Um, That treasure is fueled and funded by God. And no one else's power can top his power. So again, no matter who you align yourself with, um, I had a friend, we were texting, and he was like, man, it it would be pretty nice to be aligned with a millionaire or a billionaire, wouldn't it? It's kind of sweet to have some of those people in your circle. I say, yeah, I would would agree with that. But I would also agree with this scripture that uh, surpassing power is from God and not from us. You know, the Bible talks about promotion doesn't come from the, the, uh, the east, the west, the south. It comes from above. This is who I want to hook up with. This is who I want to be, who, who I want to have on my board of directors, have in my company. So this scripture is just ultimately a, a reminder that uh, this treasure that you have going on inside of you, I gave it to you. This is God saying, hey, I gave it to you. Um, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. So here's the deal. God assigns all of us gifts. It's our job to assign ourselves to those gifts. Ultimately, the goal is to leave no potential on the table. Ultimately, the goal is to live out one of my favorite scriptures, John 17, 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Right? I make the I make heaven go crazy when I do the things that God tells me to do, when I, when I pour out myself on other people, when I empty me of me for someone else's benefit. That's the definition of humility, emptying you of you, right? So I'll give you a few practical ways to ensure that you leave no potential on the table. That's the mission, y'all. Here, number one, assign yourself to the gifts that God has given you. What are your spiritual gifts? Angie just walked you through a process of just trying to figure that out, making the beginning steps of figuring out um, why people should be texting you for help, why people should be calling you, emailing you for help. Um, What are your spiritual gifts? It's It's important for all of us to find out what we have and how to best use it for God's glory. Number two, so we're going to assign ourselves to God's gift, uh, gifts. Um, The second thing is we want to align those gifts uh, with the world around us. You know, who needs my spiritual gift? What opportunities to use my, what are the opportunities to use my spiritual gifts? How can I be strategic? How can I be faithful? How can I be good at using my strategic, uh, using my spiritual gifts for the good of others? And then lastly, this is the most important thing, you know, apply your gifts for God's glory and for the good of man. Um, Rob will talk a little bit about the parable of the talents. Well, he'll, he'll supplement his teaching um, by pulling from the terrible, uh, Uh, parable of the talents. 
But that's the story of the servant, uh, the master giving the servants five, two, and one, and the guy with the one taking it and burying it. And the servant and the master had a problem with that. And I think um, the servant who got the one, if you read that scripture, if you read through those scriptures, once God punished him or the, uh, the master punished him, he had this long excuse of why he didn't do or why he didn't give the master a return on his investment. And I think that's sometimes what we do. Instead of doing the work to make sure we give God a return on his investment, we're working on that excuse for why we couldn't give him a return on his investment. God, I only had one parent. God, my mom died at a young age. God, I only went to University of Northern Illinois University, which is the best university in <laughs> Illinois. Okay, nobody agree with that. But we give him excuse for why we didn't give him a return on his investment. Listen, the most important thing that we can do in regards to these action steps is to apply the gifts that God has given us. Not knowing what to do is no excuse for doing nothing at all. And I believe that's the thing that God is going to hold us accountable for. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with all that? Listen to this. Can y'all hear that? There's something in here. God's like, I know I put something in you. I made you. I know what's in you. So in closing, uh, in this upside down kingdom, no one is ordinary. Um, No one is just a jar of clay. And no one was put here just to bring a return to them and to their family. Um, You are living on that dash or that squiggly line right now uh, to bring God a return on his investment by using everything that he gave you for someone else. Let's pray. God, thank you for making us every day, every moment, every situation. You are making us, you are forming us into what you created us to be. We don't need a title. We don't need a promotion. We don't need a new area code, new zip code. We have everything that we need um, to pour our lives out in this upside down kingdom. Thank you for the gifts, skills, and abilities of the men and women in this room. May they use them for your glory, for your honor, and for the good of man. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. So Tim did a great job of explaining how God grants us gifts so that we can use them in serving others. And both the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, wrote to the church repeatedly about the grace we receive when God gives us gifts and the responsibility we have as followers of Jesus to understand and use our gifts for the good of the church community. This same other focus applies to another gift that God gives us, and that has to do with our resources. In Matthew's Gospel, he recounts Jesus telling a story about bags of gold, or in earlier translation, it talked about the parable of talents. And according to Matthew, Jesus tells this story to his closest followers just days before his arrest and crucifixion. And I've often wondered if Jesus felt a sense of urgency in those last days. The only thing I can liken it to is I think my children still think of the week before they went off to college as one of the most miserable weeks of their lives because I felt the urgency to tell them everything I could think of in that last week. I know I was going to see them again, but I just felt I had to to share as much wisdom as I could with them. I wonder if Jesus felt that same sense of urgency. But in the last days, before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus shares this story in Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14. He says, again, it will be, and in the it he's referring to is the kingdom of heaven. So again, the kingdom of heaven is like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. 
You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, and here comes the excuses that Tim talked about. I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your gold in the ground. So here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I've not sown and gathered where I've not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Why do you think Jesus shared this story with his followers? Because this is not the only time Jesus addresses money. Jesus understood the pull of money. Wanting what we don't have, wanting to keep what we do have. So he repeatedly warned about the danger of wealth, about the importance of generosity, and about the responsibility we all have to be wise and God-honoring in how we use the resources he gives us. So through this story about the bags of gold, Jesus tells us a number of things with respect to our use of money, right? To one person, he gave five bags of gold. And I'm glad you mentioned Scrooge McDuck, because that's oh, what yeah, I thought yeah. of when I had these bags of gold. Yeah. Right? To one he gave five, the amount that he gave didn't matter. And then he gave somebody two bags of gold, right? And then he gave another one bag of gold. And what Jesus tells us is what we receive doesn't matter. The first thing he tells us is this money still belongs to King Jesus. Because the story tells us that the master entrusted his wealth to his servants. He entrusted him. That means he gave it to them to use in trust, to use as stewards, to manage on his behalf. So regardless of what we have, whether it's five bags or two bags or one bag or even one piece of gold, it still belongs to King Jesus. And the second thing we learn from this story is that King Jesus expects us to use whatever we have in a way that honors the king. As Tim mentioned about our gifts, it's the same thing. They're not for us. They're to honor the king and to love and serve others. Because the person, Jesus tells us in his story, the person who had five bags of gold, put it to use, and gained what? Five more bags. And the person who had two bags of gold, they took what they had and put it to use and gained two more bags. And Jesus tells each of them, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the person who was given one bag hid it, kept it to themselves, didn't put it to use. And the master has different words for them. He calls him a lazy, wicked servant. Which brings us to the third point from this story. King Jesus will hold us accountable for how we use the resources he's entrusted us. Those who use it well are described as good and faithful servants, and the person who does not invest the resources God gives them is called wicked and lazy. Here's the underlying theme of this message. What we do with our money, what we do with our gifts matters. We're clear message from this story Jesus tells that our financial gifts that we receive are not for ourselves. They're to be invested in the things that matter to the king. So I just simply ask, when we begin our money planning, do we begin with an eye toward pleasing the king? And I suppose the first question is, do we even plan with respect to money? Right? I imagine in a crowd this size, there's some of us who perhaps are not as planful or intentional with respect to our financial resources. You may know, you know that you may need to do something different. And if that's the case, if it seems like your money situation is out of control, we offer a program called Financial Peace University. It begins in September, and scores of people from this church community have benefited from that course. So if you're sitting there and you know your money situation is a mess, I would encourage you to attend, register for Financial Peace University. But that's the question for us. Do we begin our money planning with an eye toward pleasing the king? And I don't believe Jesus asked this question because God is obsessed with our money. 
Rather, I believe Jesus asked this question because God is obsessed with us. And he knows the damage that can be done to the human heart and the human soul when we don't put money in its proper place, when we think it's ours, or when we hide it, or when we don't use it. It does damage to our heart and to our soul. And so Jesus wants us to understand that what he gives us still belongs to him. And that he wants us to use it in a way that honors the king. And that we're held accountable for how we use it. That the way we use our money matters. You see, Jesus understands that generosity is good for his church. And it's also good for us. He wants us to approach all that we have with an attitude of surrender. God, it's all yours. To surrender and then listen. God, how do you want me to use it? And then obey to be faithful in doing as he tells us. But friends, we don't coast in that kind of living. You won't drift into that kind of living. You have to be, do it on purpose. We have to count the cost, Jesus tells us. Because this comes at a cost, right? This idea of using our resources for others, to use our resources in a way that honors the king, is upside down for the kingdom of the world. If you watch television or read a magazine, Millions and millions of dollars are being spent to tell you that you're unhappy and that one, you're one purchase away from being happy. But Jesus instead tells us, live with your arms, with your hands open and share with one another. And we get this beautiful image from Scripture. Luke, in, in uh, the book of Acts, writes this about the early church. Just listen to this, or you can read it on the screen. In Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 31. After they prayed... The place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in, all them, in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses, those who had bags of gold, sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This depth of community, just imagine what that's like. Knowing one another, knowing one another's needs, being in one heart and mind, and again, God's grace enabled them to share with one another such that no one claimed or treated their possessions as their own. They weren't hiding their bags of gold, but instead they were sharing it with one another. When I was a kid uh, growing up, um, you know, my family, we lived from paycheck to paycheck. There wasn't a lot of money. And um, so Christmas was a big deal. That Christmas really, and sometimes on your birthday, was really the only time you got toys, right? I mean, we were fed, we had clothes, but toys, that's what Christmas was all about. So Christmas was a big deal. And I remember one year, um, I was about 10 years old, and I had a brother, uh, two year, I have a brother two years younger than me, and then a brother 10 years younger than me. So, you know, he was just a baby. But I remember my parents setting me and my brother down and saying, you know, there is a family in our church with boys about your age, and they're not going to have Christmas this year because their dad's out of work. And so we think God is telling us to share our Christmas with them. So we haven't wrapped any of your presents yet. But we're going to put them out. You can pick one gift, and we're going to give the rest of them away to the family. And I'll never forget being in Sunday school, the, week, the Sunday after Christmas, and hearing them talk about the Christmas that they had. Now, I can't tell you what toys I received and any Christmas after that, but I will never forget that Christmas. And I so appreciate my parents living this out. They knew them, they understood their needs, and they shared freely with them. You know, King Jesus asks us to live life with open hands, to be outrageously generous as a response to his outrageous love for us. That's why a portion of your giving to Willow Chicago is shared with people in need in our church community. And frankly, we'd like to do more, as well as sharing with partners who are reaching out to the hurting and vulnerable here in the city. And that's one of the reasons why we're moving, is to free up dollars for ministry instead of paying rent. And Jesus' story to us is not about our absolute dollars, 
whether we have five bags or two bags or one bag or one piece of gold. What matters is that each of us live with an attitude of surrender, listening, and obeying. You see, most money decisions are not financial in nature. They're decisions about the goodness and faithfulness of God. And every act of generosity, even if small on an absolute basis, can, in the power of the Spirit, grow into something extraordinary. It begins with our willingness to put the king's money, which he has entrusted to us, to work, to invest in the work that God is doing, and then we let God do his work. I love this passage of Scripture from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, where he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. When we approach the king's money, which he's entrusted to us with a heart of surrender, with a willingness to listen and a courage to obey, he will take what we offer and do supernatural things with it. This is a king who turned water to wine, who fed thousands from a few loaves of bread and fishes, who makes kings and priests out of broken people like us. He engages in this supernatural multiplication. This is a king to be followed with our full devotion, with our gifts, with our resources. This is a king that is building an upside-down kingdom filled with people who are surrendered to the king and serving one another with their gifts and resources. That is who God calls us to be as his church. This is a king who deserves our very best. And friends, what life are we waiting for if we're not going to do it with this one? 